Manhunt, Hunting Britain's Most Wanted Murderer, written and read by me, Peter Blexley. This book is dedicated to Liam and Lucy. I will not rest. Acknowledgements. An astonishing number of people have helped me since I launched my hunt for Kevin Powell. There are simply too many to mention individually, but you know who you are. I send you all my undying gratitude. To everyone at Adlib Publishing and the BBC who have played a part in either this book or our award-winning podcast, I send you my heartfelt thanks. To those of you who work in the media, who have granted me airtime or column inches so that I could speak about Paul and the crimes he is wanted for, I cannot thank you enough. Please be warned, I will be on the phone to you again soon. To those who represent me and the team, I send gratitude and apologies in equal measure. To my long-suffering family, I simply say this, I do not deserve you, but I am eternally grateful that I have you. I love you all. And finally, to the courageous people who have reached out to tell me what you know about Paul, I remain forever indebted to each and every one of you. However, his capture still eludes me. If you know even a tiny bit more, you know what to do. Prologue Madeline McCann, Lord Lucan, I'm sure if I'd asked nicely enough, my publisher would have sent me out on the road, armed with my notebook and pen and my mobile phone, to research and write about either of the two biggest crime mysteries of my lifetime. But others have already done that, and I prefer to investigate cases that are no less newsworthy, yet have not garnered the publicity that I think they should have. That's why I chose to hunt Kevin Powell. By the time you listen to this, I will have been hunting him for 18 months, and I will not stop until he has been found. So, if you're looking for a book with a rewarding and satisfying end, neatly tied up with a literary bow, listen no further. Because this true crime story is very much ongoing, and the final chapter is yet to be written. Liam Kelly was 16 when he was murdered in Liverpool on the 19th of June 2004. He had been called to what is known in criminal circles as a straightener, a meeting to resolve differences. In my experience, these things have a habit of turning out badly. Liam had apparently lent someone £200, and when that money wasn't returned, he had taken it upon himself to visit the home of a relative of the man he'd lent the money to. When he didn't get what he wanted, he threw a bicycle through a window. This, apparently, was the backdrop to Liam being called on to this meeting. How pathetic, how petty, how pointless and heartbreaking is that? The events that led to his death were set in motion over nothing more than £200. Liam arrived in Grafton Street, Liverpool, as the passenger in a car and was approached by two men. A court was later told that the two men were Anthony Campbell and Kevin Powell. Liam apparently walked towards Campbell, then turned and walked towards Powell, who allegedly produced a shotgun and blasted the boy twice, once in the chest and once in the arm. Liam fell to the ground and dragged himself to a nearby house. He died of his injuries a short while later. Not long after his murder, Liam's grieving mother Mary described him to the media. Liam was always playing on motorbikes and I was always worrying that he would have an accident. He was boyish, a proper boy. He was up to all kinds of mischief. Gorgeous Liam, the man of the house, the protector of his brothers and sisters, the son who shone. The police investigation into his murder moved quickly. They identified a number of suspects and made early arrests, including Paul. A young woman came forward and made an alibi statement on behalf of Paul. The police were up against the ticking clock, and unfortunately, he was bailed while the police made their inquiries into his alibi. He would never be taken into custody again. 
Anthony Campbell and a man named Peter Sinclair did face court. Those present heard how Sinclair helped Paul by disposing of two mobile phones and being a lookout while Paul burned clothing that could have contained incriminating evidence. Sinclair was convicted of assisting an offender and got eight years, while Campbell was sentenced to life imprisonment for murder. The young woman who provided a false alibi statement for Paul was convicted of attempting to pervert the course of justice and received a short jail term. On the 10th anniversary of Liam's death in June 2014, Merseyside Police announced a £20,000 reward on offer for information leading to Paul's capture, and Mary also spoke. Liam's murder has had a devastating effect upon the family. It has destroyed my life over the last 10 years. We just want Kevin Paul brought to justice so we can at least have some closure. Just over a year after Liam's murder, on the 3rd of August 2005, on the other side of the city, Lambourne Road, Walton, in the early hours of the morning, a 22-year-old mother of three young children, Lucy Hargreaves, was on the sofa in her home. Three masked men forced their way inside her home and shot her three times. Upstairs was Lucy's partner, Gary Campbell. He was in bed with their two-year-old daughter. Their other two young children were staying with their grandparents. After Lucy was shot, petrol was poured around the house and it was set ablaze. Gary Campbell and the young child escaped the blazing house by leaping out of the first floor window. The following year, two men, Anthony Fat Tony Downs and Kirk Bradley, stood trial for Lucy's murder. The prosecution presented their case, witnesses gave their testimonies and the judge ruled that the evidence was simply not strong enough and he instructed the jury to return not guilty verdicts against the defendants. Downs and Bradley had not even had to present their defence to the charges they faced. They were duly acquitted and walked from the court as free men. Some very capable barristers were on their team. Downs was represented by Nigel Power QC, who has a website that proudly boasts... Nigel represented Tony Downs when he was acquitted of the murder of Lucy Hargreaves despite compelling telephone evidence. Clearly that evidence was not compelling enough. I would track down another barrister who worked as part of the defence team for Downs and Bradley and who spoke on the condition of anonymity. This barrister had built a reputation for forensically examining documents, detail, facts and figures and using in-depth analysis to dismantle prosecution cases. In the case of Downs and Bradley, he focused on mobile phone data. In 2005, courts were only just beginning to see this kind of evidence. It was a new investigative tool for the police, and they were learning as they went along. Perhaps not surprisingly, this barrister found flaws, and they were exploited by the defence. However, he told me, the trouble was the police made their situation worse by refusing to accept their mistakes. When such a mistake is discovered, if a police witness says, yep, I got that wrong, sorry, it leaves the defence barrister with nowhere to go. You have to accept their apology and move on. But in this case, they sometimes refuse to do that. So it gave the defence more ammunition with which to undermine the police witnesses. They dug themselves holes which they couldn't escape from. There may be a useful lesson there for any police officer listening to this. In the early stages of the failed court case, the jury had been told that in 1993, some 12 years before Lucy's murder, Gary Campbell, who was a teenager at the time, had been the passenger in a stolen car that was being driven around the streets of Highton, Liverpool. The car was being treated as a plaything, Witnesses at the time told the media how the car was driven at high speed, the engine was revved excessively and the wheels could be heard screeching as it tore around the streets. It was being driven by a 14-year-old called Andrew Ellis. As Ellis reversed the car at high speed, he collided with a number of pedestrians, one of whom was four-year-old Kevin Downs. 
Kevin was killed instantly. Anthony Fat Tony Downs was said to be traumatised by his younger brother's death. The prosecution tried to claim that the attack on Lucy's home was a revenge attack for the death of four-year-old Kevin. This remains entirely unproven. And so to Kevin Powell. My life is dedicated to the hunt for the fugitive, for I firmly believe that the very fabric of our civilised society is based on the fundamental rule that we do not kill one another. A man who is accused of killing a 16-year-old boy and a 22-year-old mother of three young children in separate and horrific incidents should not be enjoying life on the run. He should be captured so that it can be brought before a court of law to answer the allegations made against him. If you feel the way that I do, then listen on and let's hope that in the not-too-distant future, Britain's most wanted man will be in handcuffs. Thank you. Chapter 1. Concern I'm worried about you. I mean, really worried about you. These are brutal, savage crimes committed by someone with utter disregard for life. You're my friend, and I don't want anything dreadful happening to you. If these words have been uttered by one of those mates who works nine to five in an office and whose idea of danger is trying Nando's hot peri-peri sauce, then I would have been polite, appreciated their concern and dismissively replied, I'll be fine, thanks. Don't worry about me. But here I was, sitting in the delightful garden of the country's leading criminologist, a man who has spent his entire working life dealing with vicious murderers and psychopathic serial killers. Anxiety was etched deeply across Professor David Wilson's face, and for the first time in a very long while, I was lost for words. David was staring at me intently. I hurriedly decided that I needed to say something that would reassure him. I've lived in the witness protection programme when there was a very real threat to my life, and I've lived to tell the tale. I have set the parameters of my investigation to be deliberately narrow. I'm not looking to uncover and expose wider criminality. I'm merely looking for Paul. David didn't look convinced. I burbled on. My home is covered by state-of-the-art CCTV. Our burglar alarm is the best that money can buy. Our steel door sits in a reinforced steel frame and I don't have a letterbox. David's continued silence spoke volumes. He's known me long enough to know that I do not get blown off course easily. Look, I've been an investigator all my life. It's what I do. I find things out which certain people don't want me to know. I've got a network of open source intelligence gatherers, ethical hackers and 21st century digital detectives. I'm best known for tracking down pretend fugitives on Hunted, a bloody TV show. It makes absolute sense to me that I try to find a real one and they don't come any more wanted than Kevin Powell. David took a sip of coffee and I could tell that I wasn't doing a good job of allaying his fears, so I tried a change of tack. Besides, I see this as public service. I'm doing something worthwhile rather than performing in an entertainment show. David's demeanour changed in an instant. His face lit up and we went on to discuss the virtues and unparalleled satisfaction that public service can bring. With David seemingly distracted from his worries, I gave him an update on how my hunt for Paul was going and he gave me some valuable insight into the mind of someone on the run for murder. David and I always have a hug whenever we meet or say farewell. On this occasion, he clasped me particularly tightly as I left. Not for the first time, I was heading for Liverpool. Chapter 2. Why? I think I must be a masochist. I always seem to set myself the most challenging of tasks when I'm looking for a project. Researching my earlier book, To Catch a Killer, had thrown up all sorts of difficulties, not the least of them being that I was refused cooperation by the police, the murder victim's wife and the bank that he worked for. Any sane writer would have canned the idea and moved on to an easier subject. 
but those refusals merely served as red rags to this rather determined bull, and I ploughed ahead, made numerous expensive trips to Scotland, developed a number of trusted and reliable sources, and got the book written. Along the way, I achieved the three main goals that I set myself, each of which apply to the book you're listening to now. Firstly, I have to drum up significant publicity for the case. Airtime and column inches are the aim because they raise awareness and that encourages people to come forward and tell me what they know. If you search online for Alastair Wilson, who was the murder victim discussed in To Catch a Killer, you will come across my name for I was very successful in getting on the telly, on the radio and in the papers. Secondly, by achieving my first goal, I send a very clear message to my subject. I am on their case and I will not give up. Alistair Wilson's killer knows that and should not rest easily in his bed, for information continues to come my way. Likewise, the subject of this book, Kevin Powell, undoubtedly knows that I'm coming for him and I'm sure my efforts in the past 18 months have caused him some considerable discomfort and inconvenience. Good. I'm not about to stop hunting him any time soon. This book is the next step on my journey towards finding him. You are listening to the longest wanted poster ever, for which I am very grateful. When you finish listening, please recommend this book to any family member or friend. Spread the word, and together, let's make Kevin Powell the most well-known fugitive on the planet. Finally, I have to put previously unknown information into the public domain. Sharing what I've discovered may just encourage the person who holds the last piece of the jigsaw to come forward, because they may think, this bloke actually knows his stuff. He's got off his backside to do some proper research, so I'll talk to him. In recent years, I've spent many days in the company of those who have lost a loved one to murder and never sees anyone brought to justice for those crimes. Their pain does not go away. They find a way to manage it, but it is there, gnawing away in its own corrosive way. For justice is central to our very existence, and when we feel something is unjust, it hurts. I'm not naive. I know only too well that our world is far from perfect, that justice does not always reign. I've stood outside the old bailey, watching a bunch of crooks who I knew were banged to rights, laughing, joking, and giving me a two-fingered salute as they pranced off to the nearest pub to celebrate the fact that they'd just got off. Shit happens. But justice and our belief that it will prevail remains central to our thinking, or else we might as well all take up arms and summarily dispense our own vigilante-style punishment to anyone we think deserves it. And then where would we be? Chapter 3. The Build-Up the date of my press conference was Monday the 29th of April 2019, but the work had begun many weeks before then. I'd researched Kevin Powell and the crimes he was wanted for from the comfort of my box bedroom office. I read just about every article ever written about him and had submitted a synopsis to my publishers. These stalwarts of the literary world liked the idea of my manhunt and didn't mind taking a calculated risk. There was a possibility that Paul could be captured before I'd even written this book, which would mean the whole project would have to be delayed to avoid prejudicing the outcome of any criminal trial. But they were willing to take a punt. Researching unsolved murders and hunting down fugitives is an expensive business, especially when the crimes involved are many hundreds of miles from my home. The advance from my publishers was by no means huge and has had to cover travel, accommodation and living expenses. It has not been anywhere near enough to cover my costs, so I have to take on other work to fund my investigations. That's why you may see me popping up on Good Morning Britain, the Jeremy Vine show, or making a complete fool of myself on shows like Britain's Got More Talent. It's why I do public speaking gigs. It's all about putting cash in my investigations pot and attracting more attention to the case. To further boost my chances of capturing my target, I decided to make a public launch of my hunt for Paul 
at a press conference in Liverpool out of respect to that great city, its people and the murder victims who lived there, Liam Kelly and Lucy Hargreaves. I was decidedly nervous because I was still not sure if there would be any interest in me and my hunt. I notified Merseyside Police of my intentions as past experience had taught me that some police forces regarded me as a nuisance. A mate of mine had recently attended a social function in Scotland with senior police officers in attendance. He overheard a senior officer talking about the Alistair Wilson case. We thought we'd done a reasonable job on that investigation until that irritating C-U-N-T Peter Blexley showed up, poking his fucking nose around and causing us a shitload more work. I had mixed feelings about this. I was glad that my revelations had caused the force to do more work. I knew their investigation had been flawed, but I was disappointed that they held such a narrow-minded, unimaginative view of what I do. It had always been my intention to work with police in Scotland, but they wanted a one-way street. Their idea was that I would tell them everything and they would give me nothing in return. I don't know of a relationship on earth that works well that way. I was hoping for a more enlightened attitude from the police in Liverpool. I went to the very top. I emailed Chief Constable Andy Cook an outline of my intentions and ambitions. I made it clear that I was not setting out to embarrass the police in any way, but that I hoped we all shared the same goal, that of capturing Kevin Powell. I also attached a copy of my book synopsis. I could not have been more open or transparent. Somebody within Merseyside Police knew me already from the hunt for an escaped prisoner. In 2014, Sean Walmsley had murdered 33-year-old Anthony Duffy in a dispute over drugs. Walmsley was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 30 years. In 2016, he made an appeal that failed and he knew he would be in his late 50s by the time he became eligible for parole. Clearly not thrilled at the prospect, Walmsley and associates staged a successful armed escape during a hospital visit. In February 2018, while I was still the chief of Channel 4's Hunted, Merseyside Police tweeted out, Peter Blexley, can you help support our appeal? Sean Walmsley is a highly dangerous individual convicted of a savage murder. We are determined to find him. They wanted me to retweet their message, and I added, Only too happy to help. Where's Walmsley? You can contact me in absolute confidence. I can guarantee lifelong anonymity. I'm not sure if the police were thrilled at me offering lifelong anonymity to anybody that came forward, but that was the deal I put on the table, and I meant it. I had previous in this regard. I once gave evidence in a case in which I had worked undercover, and it got to a very tricky point in the trial where the judge ordered me to disclose the identity of the person who had introduced me as a fellow crook to the defendants. As far as I was concerned, that was a wholly unjustified fishing exercise by a smart defence barrister, and I refused. The judge did his nut and threatened me with all sorts, but I held firm. He had already put me in danger by forcing me to give evidence using my real name rather than my undercover identity. He and I were not exactly on friendly terms. After days of legal arguments and ferocious cross-examination by barristers and the judge, it came to the crunch. Either I revealed the identity or the case would be slung out. So be it. I was not going to bow to threats and intimidation wherever it came from. To the sound of cheering and clapping from the dock and the public gallery, the defendants were set free and the judge summoned me back into the witness box. He completely lost his rag and told me that I was in contempt of court. Fuck him. He then bottled out of sending me to prison, saying it should be a matter for the Director of Public Prosecutions. He released me, pending that decision. I walked from the court in time to see the defendants and their friends and family firmly sticking it to the officer in the case. As I joined this beleaguered detective inspector, the South London old-time lag 
that I'd spent a lot of time negotiating with in my undercover guys, hollered over. Oi, Detective Inspector, that Peter Blexley is a lot better man than your informants. At least he keeps his mouth shut. In my life, the rules I abided by then stand firm today. I do not declare my sources, unless, of course, you choose to double-cross me, in which case all bets are off. In 2018, the Liverpool Echo ran a story mentioning me, headlined, Merseyside Police Ask Reality TV Detective for Help in Hunt for Sean Walmsley. They described me as tough talking. I thought there was more than a hint of sarcasm in the final line of their article. Officers would ask anybody, reality TV or otherwise, who has seen Walmsley to contact them. The fugitive was finally captured by armed police in Leeds. He apparently said to the police, as they bundled him, handcuffed into the back of a car, good job, boys. Now I was letting the same police force know about my new case. I didn't have to wait long for a reply. I was soon talking to the man in charge of the police hunt for Paul, a detective chief inspector, or DCI, who will remain nameless. I had some additional news for him. Chapter 4. The Launch In 2018, Celebrity Hunted was nominated for a BAFTA, and my beloved mate Ben Owen, my deputy on the show, and later Chief, and I put on our posh togs for the ceremony. By and large, the evening was a complete pile of old tosh. We got beaten in our category by Love Island, which didn't help the evening. We had first been crammed together in a reception area where a young lady, who had clearly had a very early start to her drinking, managed to puke all over my shoes at 6.30pm. But there was one notable highlight that evening. While outside for a smoke, I met a giant of a man who introduced himself as Mark. It didn't take long for me to discover that he was a podcast producer with an interest in true crime. That was it. We were off and running. The conversation and questions were non-stop. Mark and I exchanged phone numbers before we parted and vowed to meet again over another smoke. We did exactly that. When we discovered instant chemistry and agreed it would be great if we could work together on a podcast sometime. Mark made the potential of a series feel like a very different proposition from the slow and frustrating processes involved in TV production. He thought it was likely to get commissioned because there was a lot less money involved in the making of a podcast, explaining that it would just be him and a microphone accompanying me. There would be some money to put towards the hunt, which would be great, because I was convinced there would be some foreign travel involved in this case. Mark went off and pitched the idea to the BBC and arranged a meeting with a couple of their senior radio people. Over a coffee, a few months later, I very enthusiastically explained what I was going to do and how I would do it. We were asked to make a pilot episode of Manhunt, Finding Kevin Powell, and now it seemed a number of ducks were beginning to fall into a rather neat row. Ahead of the press conference, there was a lot to get done. A website had to be built, the invitations had to be sent out, and I got hundreds of flyers printed. I wanted large posters of Pal printed. As the day of the conference loomed, I tallied up the expense so far. £1,800 out of pocket already. Don't tell the wife. I had a long telephone chat with the DCI from Merseyside Police. He was the epitome of professionalism and extremely courteous. We agreed that we shared the aim of seeing Paul captured, but the DCI, however, was now dealing with an unprecedented situation. Capturing fugitives was for law enforcement, not for writers. Over various conversations, we agreed we had the interest of the victims' families at heart. 16-year-old Liam Kelly and 22-year-old Lucy Hargreaves. Those young lives cut brutally short motivated us, always. The DCI informed the families about my work, but they told him they were not willing to speak to me 
at this stage. Of course, I was disappointed, but I harboured the hope that they might change their minds once they saw what I was doing and the progress I hoped to make. Mark also hoped to interview Liam and Lucy's relatives. He was determined to put Liam and Lucy at the very front of the podcast series, and rightly so. I did wonder if I should adopt a rather cynical attitude and convince myself that the police had told them not to speak to me, but I have no evidence of that. Even so, if that had happened, it wouldn't have surprised me, because the police's natural default position is that of control. It's what they do. The police control crowds at football matches or demonstrations. They control victims, witnesses, investigations, suspects, one another. Control is what they do, and in my experience, when they are not in control, they don't like it. I've known many cops who finish work only to go home and control their partners. Maybe that's part of the reason why so many of them get divorced. Anyway, the DCI couldn't control me, and I think he was wise enough to recognise that. He gave me the impression of being a thoroughly decent bloke, who I suspected might be a bit of fun once he's off duty, freed of the shackles of rank, position and procedure. One of the questions I was very keen to get an answer to was whether or not the £20,000 reward that had previously been on offer for information leading to Paul's capture still stood. That was a very tempting character dangle and I was keen to make that known far and wide. The DCI confirmed its existence but said it was subject to Paul's capture and conviction. I felt this was manifestly unfair on any public-spirited citizen who gave the vital information, only to see the cash disappear if Paul was later found not guilty. There are so many factors that can affect a criminal trial. The police can make a mistake during their investigation. The Crown Prosecution Service can get something wrong perhaps failing to disclose relevant information to the defence that can cause a case to collapse. A judge can misdirect a jury. A jury can be nobbled by criminals who find out where the jurors live and threaten them. And sometimes, juries just return perverse verdicts. There are many more reasons why a person could be acquitted, not least because they're innocent. What if Paul was caught and found guilty of one murder, but not the other? Was the DCI seriously saying that the reward would not be paid even under those circumstances? That would be utterly preposterous. The DCI said that the police would have to take a pragmatic view. Too bloody right they would, I thought to myself. I was not particularly happy, but our discussions always remained polite and courteous, despite any differing views. The DCI took the news of a possible BBC podcast series in addition to the book, in his stride. The press conference was held in London in the end, rather than Liverpool. It was felt that some key journalists wouldn't make the journey up north. I've given hundreds of media interviews over the years, but as my agent and the team began setting up the banners, posters and flyers, the nerves started to jangle. Mark arrived in good time, complete with his microphone, of course. I was waiting for the news outlets, the big hitters who would guarantee that my hunt for Paul was heard. I was delighted to see Danny Shaw, the BBC Home Affairs correspondent. The Press Association were also present, and as many media outlets took a feed from their output, this was a result. I told the assembled journalists why I was going to hunt Paul and what my motives were. I have absolutely no idea how long I spoke for, because I was so engrossed. There was a stream of relevant, well-placed questions, which I felt I handled OK. Mark, my agent and I, all thought it had gone well, that the number and range of journalists present was good, and that the hunt had got off to a positive start. I hailed a black cab, and dragged in my small but very heavy suitcase, containing the many hundreds of flyers I was going to distribute in Liverpool. I also had a rucksack that was so full I could barely close the zips and a large cardboard tube containing the rolled-up Kevin Pyle posters. I may have uttered the odd expletive 
as I bundled all this stuff into the cab. My destination was the still young radio station, Talk Radio, and Eamon Holmes, who I have known for years. Back in the day, when he was presenting the breakfast show on Sky News, I'd quite often be alongside him, talking about crime and policing. Now he was presenting the drive time show and allowing me to spread the word about Paul. Normally, I pride myself on being professional in studios. I leave my phone outside, switch to silent or in airplane mode. Now I had a burner phone that I'd sourced purely to use in my hunt for Paul. Its number was on the flyers, posters and banners and had been given to the journos who'd attended the press conference. I'm looking at that phone as I record this now. It is always within my reach. In my wildest and nonsensical dreams, I hoped that soon after going public with my hunt, somebody would call me with the vital information on Paul's whereabouts. You can guess the next bit, right? Yep, you got it. As I was broadcast into the nation, the blooming thing rang. I was embarrassed and excited in equal measure. The excitement soon disappeared once I discovered the caller was a lazy journalist who couldn't be asked to dig out my personal phone number. I hurriedly apologised and explained to the listeners why I had the phone. Affa Belayman was absolutely fine with it. We talked about the details of the murders Paul was wanted for and what I had already discovered about him. It was soon time for another expensive black cab journey this time to Euston Station to catch a train to Liverpool. I was laden down with all my clobber and I didn't fancy trudging up and down escalators and battling onto trains. I met up with Mark again at Euston and we discussed strategy over a hurriedly demolished plate of pasta. I was spreading the word about my hunt for Paul before I even reached my destination. A British transport police officer recognised me from TV and we started to chat. His dedication to his role as a police officer shone through. I know our world is a far from perfect one, and the same can be said of our police, but in my considerable experience, the overwhelming majority of our frontline officers are dedicated public servants to whom we owe a great debt. Sadly, they are often led by fools in the very senior ranks. In the past decade... Policing has largely been devalued, dismantled and nearly destroyed, particularly by Theresa May. Thank fuck she's no longer in the Home Office or Downing Street because she's a deluded and dangerous idiot. Our brave police officers became demoralised beyond compare because of her failure to understand or appreciate modern-day policing and the savage cuts she imposed on policing budgets that led to some 20,000 fewer police patrolling the streets. I sincerely hope policing is repaired by politicians, and soon. We are all in a bit more danger if it is not. Another delightful passenger was convinced she recognised me from Dragon's Den. I bloody wish. My small pile of fivers would look distinctly out of place alongside the wads of £50 notes that the multi-millionaire dragons have on display in the show. I politely pointed out where she might have seen me instead and, of course, she also received a flyer. Two hours flew by and Liverpool Lime Street Station was almost in view. I was returning to a city with which I had quite a bit of history. I wanted to be the first off so that I could position myself by the ticket barriers and hand out flyers to our fellow passengers as they headed for the exit. Mark and I struggled through numerous train carriages, taking great care not to bash anyone with our bags of clothing and kit as we made our way to the front of the train. A tip. When you hand out flyers, make sure you tell people that you're not trying to sell them anything. Explain as quickly as you can who you are and what you're doing. Some people will always blank you. Others may take the flyer and quickly discard it but I didn't have to wait long before I had a bit of a result. One family were happy to talk. The mum claimed to be the cousin of a famous Liverpool football legend. 
She instantly knew who Pa was and expressed her disgust at the crimes he was wanted for and the fact that he was still on the run. She gave me a second or third-hand story of how Paul was seen to bottle someone in a hotel bar in Spain. The assault she described was vicious and apparently without motive, but, unfortunately for me, she had not witnessed the crime herself. The man explained that the hotel was frequented by prostitutes, to which his daughter exclaimed, How do you know that, Dad? We all laughed as her dad squirmed, explaining that it was just one of those things he knew. Mark said we thought Paul had run with a notorious firm of Liverpool fans who called themselves the Urchins. The dad took a sharp intake of breath and stepped back at the mere mention of this gang. Everyone knows the Urchins, he said with more than a hint of fear in his voice. The family wished me good luck with my search and promised to spread the word. I thought this was a very encouraging start to my time in Liverpool, although their hotel story had been a bit light on detail and they didn't know its exact location. I wasn't able to put any flesh on the bones of this tale, nor have I been able to find any evidence whatsoever that Paul committed that particular assault. However, first-hand accounts of Paul and his unpleasantness would not be long in coming. Another lady we spoke to at the railway station suggested Paul might be in Holland, but she said that was just her theory, largely based on the fact that two other notorious criminals from Liverpool, Anthony Fat Tony Downs and Kirk Bradley, who had both been acquitted of Lucy's murder, had been captured there for other offences some years ago. You'll hear more of them later as well. Mark and I jumped into a cab and asked the driver to take us to the budget hotel I'd used a few months earlier when I'd delivered a talk about my research work. The rooms were clean, had a comfy bed, a shower, and there was a bar. It was perfect for my needs. By the time we dumped our bags, it was 9.30pm. I find it very helpful to talk to publicans and cab drivers. They tend to know their city or town and what's going on, because they interact with the public all the time. They have their ears to the ground. I asked the hotel receptionist to direct us to the nearest pub, and, ten minutes later, Mark and I had pints of delicious bitter in one hand and bunches of flies in the other. I asked the landlord if it was OK to hand out flies to his punters. He was fine with that. In fact, he took a read of my flyer and asked a few questions about the murders. Then Mark headed to one end of the bar and I started at the other. We were both surprised by the reaction we got from the customers. Universally, it was, Kevin who? No, nope, never heard of him. We spent considerable time explaining the murders and what I was doing. But the punters came on board and all of them asked if they could take more than one flyer to show to family, friends or work colleagues. I was massively encouraged by these responses. It had been a long, full-on day as Mark and I left the pub and wearily made our way back to the hotel. By way of a nightcap, we bought a bottle of wine from the hotel bar, which we drank on a terrace out the back that overlooked the renovated docks. Our journey into the unknown was now well and truly underway. There was no turning back, no shelving the book idea or ditching the podcast in favour of doing something easier or better paid. Through my press conference, my posts on social media and my interactions with the public, the word was unmistakably out there. Many people now knew I was hunting Kevin Parle. Chapter 5. The First of Many It was 7.10am on day two of my search and I was unusually enjoying a deep slumber in my hotel bed. I'm normally an early riser. I heard an unfamiliar ringing noise, which I struggled to recognise for a few moments. Then it dawned on me. It was my burner phone. I am hypersensitive to my regular phone's ringtone. The phone is usually with me 24 hours a day. I sometimes find myself reaching out to answer it, only to realise it's an advert or TV drama. 
If only I could figure out how to download some personalised fancy ringtone, then I suppose that wouldn't happen. Mind you, whenever I hear someone answer to the theme tune from the Sweeney or some football chant, I don't exactly think of the owner in glowing terms. As soon as I realised what was calling me, I leapt straight out of the bed in complete panic mode, grabbed at the phone, fumbled it for what seemed like an eternity, before eventually finding the right button to answer. I was hugely relieved when I heard a voice at the other end. I had been worried that they would have hung up. This caller cut straight to the point. He told me that he had seen a man who he believed was Kevin Powell only ten days earlier at a travelling funfair in a town called Hilversum, Holland. The caller explained that he was an expat Liverpudlian and that he had followed the police hunt for Powell in the media over the years. He had also caught the early publicity around my search and decided to pass this information on. This caller was very precise with the date, time and location of this sighting. He went on to tell me there was a permanently sighted CCTV camera at the entrance to the funfair, which would have definitely filmed the man he thought was Powell. The source told me that he had felt quite intimidated when he had walked past the man because he was convinced he'd just had a close encounter with a man wanted for two murders. The source told me I could call him back if need be, but only at specific times. I thanked him, leaned back in my chair and pondered what to do next. I was gagging for a cup of coffee and a fag. I can't begin to function properly in the morning until I've had caffeine and nicotine. I don't expect to make old bones. If I do, it'll be some kind of miracle. I threw a pair of jeans over my pyjama bottoms, pulled on a fleece and made my way downstairs. I fed my cravings and was considerably more awake than I had been when the burner phone first rang. I returned to look at my scribble notes and cursed myself out loud. There were some gaps in the information some questions that I should have asked the caller but didn't. I was pretty pissed off with myself. I began to question whether I was really up to the task I'd set myself. At 59 years old, was the brain too old and slow for the cut and thrust of hunting someone like Paul? I sat in silence for a few moments. I parked my self-doubt firmly elsewhere. I will do this, my brain shouted to itself. Due to the time restraints the source had imposed, I knew we wouldn't be able to speak for another 24 hours. But as the information was so recent, I felt it needed an urgent response. I was going to be in Liverpool for another three days. Whoever operated that CCTV system in Holland was highly unlikely to allow me access to the footage as a writer and most definitely not a part of the establishment. Time was of the essence, I thought, but I really needed to consider my next move. If I was going to pass to the police every scrap of information I received, then I would be nothing more than their stooge, and I think the media and public would quickly suss that out. Any credibility I had as a...